journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used Take the journey of a lifetime ancient and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program. Okay, wonderful. So, our topic this morning is called Global Economic Meltdown, the Keys to Financial Security. And so, uh, we begin our topic tonight by uh, quoting Thomas Friedman. He wrote this book on globalization called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. You may have read this book out there. And what um, he discusses in this book, that uh, we're living in a world global village. And it's quite true, isn't it? It's only in the last 10, 15 years that because of technology and other factors that the world seems to be a smaller place, okay? And so in his book about uh, the global village, he talks about three factors that has contributed to this globalization that you and I find ourselves in this morning. So he mentions three driving factors. And the first one he suggests in his book, uh, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, is the de democratization of technology, in other words, he's saying because of technology, because everyone has access to the internet and to our phones and all our technological gadgets, that this world seems to be a smaller place. In fact, I feel a little bit old because it wasn't only until 2003 that um, the world was introduced to YouTube. Anyone use YouTube? Okay, okay, a few, few hands going up. I love YouTube, by the way, because there's, there's so much good. There's also some bad stuff on there. It's how you use it, really. And so um, when you look at... Um, democratization of technology. Um, Friedman says that because of technology, we are now a global village. And the second one he also says is the democratization of finances. And again, he mentions in his book that maybe because we have access to funds now more than ever, you, you and I, if you if uh, we wanted some money, we go to the banker and we apply for a loan and we uh, ask for finances. And so it seems like in our culture today, if we want access to money, it's quite simple. There's steps. And have you seen those TV commercials that even if you're in debt and you just seem to be, you know, you're just struggling financially, there's some institution that's willing to lend a hand, right? And so there's this idea of democratization of finances. And the third thing he mentions in his book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, he says there's a democratization of information, and I don't know about you today, friends, but we're living in a day and age where it seems like we are just flooded with information, with Mr. Google and, the, and Safari and our, and our internet devices. You can just punching anything in, the, in your internet browser and sure enough, things will pop up. In fact, we mentioned in our first program, you type in the word prophecy, there's somewhere in the ballpark figure of 70, uh, sorry, 54 million hits just by the simple word of prophecy. And so... When you read Friedman's book, he mentions that these are some of the driving factors that uh, contribute to our world. We're living in a global village, okay? So, so the idea of this understanding of that we're living in a global village, there are actually some serious complications. And one of the things could be that there is the opportunity for global economic control. And so we, if you've been coming to our seminars, you have noticed that last week we talked about the two beasts of Revelation. In Revelation, uh, John sees beasts and somewhat these figures in the Bible. And we've been studying that the beasts are not literal animals. They're, they are representative of, of systems or powers or kingdoms, right? And so the other night we shared um, that the land beast of Revelation chapter 13 um, is actually referring to Protestant America. And so to begin our topic tonight, because we're talking about global economic meltdown, I want you to notice the Bible prediction of how this could maybe come about. And so as we've been doing every night and every morning, say the word in yellow with me, all right? So it says here, our first text this morning, it says, He the land beast causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark. If you come tonight, we're going to be talking about this in a bit more detail. 
to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no one may do what? Buy or sell. That's an economic term. So the land beast is going to cause everybody not to buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the name of the beast, the number of his name. I'm going to talk about the mark of the beast tonight, so you don't want to miss tonight's topic. So here's the point this morning. This land beast power, which we understand as Protestant, apostate Protestantism, is going to cause the world in some way or another an economic uh, sanction or so to speak that people may not be able to buy or sell unless they have this particular mark. And so the second possibility about this uh, implication about this global village that we're living in is the possibility for a global economic collapse. Now again, uh, we turn to the book of Revelation in just a moment, but as you can see, the GFC, the global financial crisis that hit the world back in 2008, I believe, we can see that, um, that these things could very well happen again. Do you, do you agree with what I'm saying? So, and, and these things just happened um, not long ago. And so the Bible actually talks about the fact that there could actually be a global economic collapse. And so when we look at uh, kingdoms such as Babylon the Great, um, this power is only going to be depicted in the book of Revelation in symbolic terms. But we noticed the other night that Babylon, there is a threefold union between the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast. And we've come to the tail end of our topic to, uh, series the last few weeks, and we've noticed that the dragon is a symbol in Revelation of, does anyone know? Satan or the devil. And just the other night, we identified the two beasts. The sea beast is the church of Rome. That comes out of the sea with the seven heads and ten horns. We talked about that at length last few meetings. And then we identify the land beast as apostate Protestantism. Has a, comes out of the earth. He's a body of a lamb. But then he speaks like a dragon. Very, very important. And so when you look at this threefold union, the Bible actually predicts that there'll be an economic collapse in Babylon. Let's see what the Bible says. The Revelation says, alas, alas. That great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore, for in one hour such great riches come to nothing. Now, now the big picture of this verse is saying that there will come a line when Babylon is going to have a global economic collapse this threefold union. So the question this morning is, how can we survive the global economic meltdown? How can you and I this morning have confidence that when we see this global economic meltdown happen in our world, how can you and I be secure? How can you and I be safe um, through these troubling times that are just ahead? So this morning, we're going to look at the keys to financial security. Now, this is not a get rich quick seminar this morning. This is not how you can make you know, X amount of money in, in, in so little time. We're going to look at the Bible. And, and if there's anything you've been learning every morning and every night, is that I've been doing my best to see what the Bible is saying. You don't want to hear what I have to say. We want to see what God's Word says, because we've been noticing night after night that it is a dependable and trustworthy source. So this morning, I'm going to outline from the Bible some keys to financial security. And what you're going to discover this morning is that these are God's secrets for providing for His children. And the context means if you and I have decided to follow Jesus, you and I have decided to put our trust in the God of heaven, He promised to take care of us. Is that good news? He's promised to take care of us. That's what I love about following God. So the first thing I wanted to look at this morning is that we realize that one of the keys to financial security is to trust God and to rest in His care. I love what Jesus says here in these words. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, can you help me out? What does he say? Do not worry. What does he say? Do not worry. Man, we could apply, we should try to learn that in our own lives, right? Jesus says, don't worry. Why? He says about your life, what you'll eat, nor about the body, what you'll put on. Consider the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap, which they have neither storehouse nor barn. And what happens? God feeds them. Then he goes on to say, Of how much more value are you than the birds? 
If then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, help me out, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. I need to learn this myself as a speaker. That God says to me, William, don't worry. I have your back, so to speak. Your father knows that you need these things. And my friends this morning, that's really at the heart of our talk this morning. Yeah, we're going to talk about biblical principles of money and stewardship. But the real heart of the matter this morning is there is a God in heaven and he desires to take care of his children. And I want you to know this morning, regardless of how much money you have in the bank or how little you have in the bank, the real reality is God says he'll take care of us. And I want, I'm hoping I'll bring that nice, loud and clear this morning's presentation. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 5, the Bible says... Casting all your care upon him, for God or he cares for you. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That when we look at the Bible, we look at the word of God. The Bible tells each of us, there's a God in heaven and he cares for us. He loves us. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel good about myself because I can't see God up there. But somewhere up there, I realize there's a God in heaven and he takes care of me. I remember when I was studying at Avondale and I was studying uh, to do ministry and I remember my lecturer, he was kind of expounding on the Bible and all this stuff and, and he had this kind of moment and he was sharing with the students. He said, he said, you know, he went out that night, you know, you have to take your garbage out, you know, the, you know, you know, the red, the big green bins and all that stuff. So he's putting out his, 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 the rubbish one maybe. You know, he takes the, the bin out to the front. And then as he's turning around back into his house, he just looked up and he saw the stars. Have you ever had that when you've just looked out in the stars one night and they're so beautiful? And he had this moment when he's looking at the stars and he says, Wow, somewhere up there is a God in heaven. I think about that. Like we're actually saying, the Bible is saying that somewhere up there, I can't see it, but there is a God in heaven and he loves me. Now that takes faith. That takes faith. But God doesn't invite us to have blind faith. He says that our faith increases as we see the word and as we see prophecy being fulfilled. Jesus says in John 14 verse 29, These things I've spoken to you before it comes to pass, so when it does come to pass, you might believe. And so, friends, when the Bible says he cares for you, this is not just some nice thing we say and we kind of tuck our kids. God cares for you. He means it in the absolute sense of the word. And we see it in the very person of Jesus of how much he does care. So the second point this morning is key to financial security is we make God our second priority. Oh, I hope you're waking up this morning. What does it say? First, okay, some of you just say, yeah, we may go at our second priority. <laughs> you got to watch the preachers, you know, they might throw a few things there to wake you up. Make God your what priority? Your first. Listen to what Jesus says. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Are you seeking God and his righteousness this morning, friends? Is he first in your life? If not, friends, I want you to consider your life. Put God first in your studies, young people. Uh, for you parents, to gather your children around. Let them see that you're putting God first. Jesus says these words, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In other words, He's talking about the temporal life as well. God knows how much money. He knows the bills that are due. Do you think God doesn't know? He knows. He knows all your financial needs. He knows how much you need to put the kids through school. He knows that you're running low in the cupboard with food. God knows all these things. But he's looking at the heart and he's asking, is that person putting me first? Yes, sure enough, God may bring you through some trials and there may be things happening in your life. In fact, when you start to follow God, things sometimes get a lot worse before they get better. Any witnesses in here this morning? And so you have to understand that following God is not just about everything's just going to be okay. What it means is, although these things happen, I understand that God is there. That's the difference, friends, that God has promised to be there. So Jesus says to us this morning, put me first, put God first. And he says, all these things will be added to you. Number three, keys to financial security. Remember, God owns how much? He owns everything. I have people saying, why are you talking to me about money, William? God doesn't need our money, right? 
He looks at the heart. And look what the Bible says. Psalm 24. King David says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. David understood that everything belongs to who? Belongs to God exactly. In fact, in Psalm 50, we Christians often quote this in their prayers when they're talking about God and He's amazing how He owns everything. For every beast of the forest is mine. This is God speaking. And the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are, are whose? Mine. God owns everything. So as we're going to talk in a few moments about financial uh, accountability and how we are to be good stewards in what God has entrusted to us. I just want to make it clear. God doesn't need our money. God owns everything. But he's looking for the heart. In fact, God owns all things twice. Not only because he created us. If you, if you want to believe the biblical uh, worldview of, of creation, that God created the heavens and the earth, we're not only his because of creation, but we're also his because of redemption. In other words, he bought us back, right? And so we are twice his, by creation and by redemption. Number four, we're also keys to financial security. We remember we are God's managers. I want you to listen to what Peter says, one of the closest followers of Jesus. He says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good what? Stewards, that's the word there, of the manifold grace of God. What's a steward, if you're asking this morning? Well, according to the Oxford Dictionary, a steward is a person entrusted with the management of another's property. In fact, I can speak to this in a very literal sense. I'm driving around New Zealand for the last few weeks in a little Hyundai Gets. It's a little rental. All of the speakers have one of these. Now, that car's not mine, right? So when we got off the airport a few weeks ago, we had to sign a waiver. We basically say, if, if anything happens to this car, whose fault is it? It's mine. And I have to sign the dotted line. So if anything happens to that car, I am responsible. And in the same way, when God gives us gifts, and, time, and you'll see this tonight, this morning, that we're stewards of it. And we shared the other week, one of the stewards that, we are, uh, that God invites us to be good stewards of is our body. Remember we said that the other week? God cares about what we eat. He actually cares what we put in our mouth. Why? Because the Bible says that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the ways we are stewards of God's temple. And by the way, if you've been coming to our programs, we mentioned that one day Jesus is going to change this vile body, this corruptible will put on incorruption. Some of you remember that talk. Doesn't it stand to reason that if God doesn't, can't, we can't, let me put it there. If we can't take care of the temporal bodies that God gives us now, do you think God is going to allow us to have glorified bodies that last through eternity? We have to take care of the bodies he gives us now, right? And so a steward is someone who's entrusted. In other words, it's not mine. That car I'm driving around is not mine. I can't do with it as I, I please because it belongs to someone else. And in the same way, as followers of Jesus, we understand that we are stewards. God gives us these gifts and talents and abilities. And we must be saying, Lord, thank you for these gifts. Help me to do it to use these gifts for the honor and glory of your name and your name alone. So how can we be good stewards? Well, I'm going to share a few things this morning. One of the things we can be a good steward is, is God's gift of life. In other words, uh, Psalm 139 verse 14, David says in the Psalms, I will praise you. Does anyone know that verse? For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David understood that his body, his life, was by virtue of God's gift of creation. You know, I, when I wake up in the morning and uh, when I have my quiet time with the Lord, I thank Him. I say, Lord, thank You for the breath of life. Thank You that I wake up, that I'm clothed in my right mind. Thank You that You kept me through the night, that nothing bad happened to me. So I wake up and I acknowledge that God is the one that gives me life, right? So we acknowledge that God's gift of life and that's why, again, when we talk about the body and we talk about it, it's not about do's and don'ts of what you eat. It's about the fact that life is sacred. 
We shared the other night about the commandments. What's so important about it? If we love God, we'll keep the first more. If we love our fellow man, we will keep the last six. Why? Because life is sacred. Another way we can be good steward is God's gift of time. God's gift of what? Time. And right now, you and I, whether you realize it or not, we are exercising this privilege, this gift. Because today, the Bible says, is the seventh day Sabbath. And God says, hey, on this day, special time. Other six days, you earn a livelihood, you do what you need to do. But on this day is sacred time. And you and I can and use time to the best of our ability. Every one of us here has 24 hours in the day. It's how we use that time. And, and as stewards of, of God, if, we're, if we want to follow God, we will do the best with the time that we have. Another way that we could um, be good stewards is our talents uh, or what? Gifts that who gives? God gives. So I may have particular talents that my sister may have and Bryn's got talents that I may not have and vice versa. The question is, what can I do with the gifts, with the talents that God has given me? If you're sitting here this morning, I don't know what, what gifts I have, William. Well, what are you good at? People will tap and show, that's a good, I like the way you do that. That could be an indication of where your gifts may lie. My gift is not music, Okay. I'll just tell you right now. Now, you might be, I'll give you an example. When I was studying over there for ministry, I was with all the boys and all this big group. We were kind of uh, closing Sabbath and everyone was kind of, there was a guitar there. Let me just cut the story short. The guitar was there and they say, oh, William, he can play the guitar because they thought Pacific Island, of course he can play the guitar. They give it to me and I'm like, Mary, I can't play the guitar. And then they thought I was just being humble about it. So they thought, no, he really can play. Oh, give it to him. No, he can really play. I said, bro. Cannot play. They looked at me in shock. Like, who is this guy? He's a Pacific Islander. He doesn't know how to play. And I said, seriously, I can't play because the God hasn't given me that gift. In fact, when I was at college, I tried to, for a whole semester, I tried to learn. I said to my friend, bro, what's the easiest song to play? We're like two, three chords. Yeah, bro, play Amazing Grace, do a G. Do a... I couldn't do it. I don't know. I seem to have big enough hands to strum and I just don't have the coordination. And when I see other people get up the front, they just go on the keyboard. I'm just like, no, where's my gift? We all have different gifts. So my gift may not be music. It may be something else. And whatever your gift is, my friends, do it to the best of your ability. Where I'm from, I'm part of a church where we have some elderly folk. They can't get up and they can't go around and do all these things that young people can do. They, there's a, a ministry within, in our church where there's some old, ooh, be careful what I say, there's some, some ladies there and they, uh, they do crocheting and knitting. So they do that and they knit and they knit and they give it, to, give it to the homeless, give it to people in need. Do you see what I'm saying? They can do what they can do. So you know what that means for us? None of us here has an excuse, right? If you want to follow God, God says he wants to use your talents for his glory. And now to, to point D, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on this one. We can also be good stewards on the money that God provides. Let me share with you a text here that sets this uh, point in context. The book of Deuteronomy says, And you shall remember, this is God speaking through Moses to the Israelites. He says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. So who gives us power to get wealth? God, who gives us the power to get up every morning and go to work and go in the car and, and, and do all those things we do? We just get in automatic mode. We're answering the phone. We're doing the bills. We're paying. Who gives us the power to do that? God, the Bible says. It says it is he who gives us the power to get wealth. And so how do we remember and acknowledge that it is God that gives us the power to get wealth? Well, I want to share with you just very briefly a story we find in the Old Testament. And the story is told of a, the patriarch Isaac. And uh, he was getting old. I'm trying to summarize this story. And basically it was time to give the birthright to the oldest, which was Esau. And so long story short, the birthright should have passed to the oldest son, which was Esau. But then when uh, uh, Isaac was telling Esau that the time was coming, that he's going to bless his oldest son, uh, the wife, Rebecca, was listening in the background because she had favored young uh, Isaac. 
uh, sorry, so, yeah, so Jacob, thank you, Brett. Jacob, rather than Esau, the older brother, there was a, fa- there was a plot there where the mother said, look, your, brother, your dad's going to bless Esau. Go out to the field, get a cattle, and bring the, the food so that he eat it and may bless you. Long story short, the younger brother Jacob, uh, oops, the younger brother Jacob deceived his father and stole the birthright that belonged to Esau's brother. When the story happened, Esau was vivid, wanted to kill his own brother. And so because of the deception of Jacob, he basically deceived his brother for the birthright. And so what happens next in the story? We find that Jacob flees for his life. The mother says, look, I just heard what Esau said. He's not happy with you. He's waiting the days, counting the days till he's, the father dies and then he's going to take your life. So Jacob now is a fugitive. He runs away from his father. Can you imagine this? One night he's with his family at home in the comforts of his father's mother's house. The next night he's a fugitive. He's running for his life. The Bible says that he spent a night there with a stone for a pillow. Seemingly distant from God. Remorseful for what he had done to his brother. Remorseful of how he deceived his own father. And he slept that night and the Bible says that he had a dream. He had a dream, the Bible says, that he saw a staircase ascending to heaven. The Bible says he saw a dream where the angels of God were ascending and descending down, up and down this staircase. In fact, the staircase would have looked like one of these uh, temples with staircases going up that you find in Mexico. But they would have had these similar things in Bible times, in Mesopotamia. So maybe he would have seen something like that in the vision. We don't know. Just giving you a visual picture. And so when Jacob had that dream... I want you to notice what happened. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord stood above it. And he said, what does he say to him, friends? I am with you. you. And will keep you wherever you go. And what will he do? I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I've done what I've spoken to you. You know, Jacob felt distant from God. But God appeared to him in a vision that night. He said, Jacob, I'm with you. You may have made a mistake, but I'm with you. Isn't that good about God? God says to us this morning, although we've messed up in our past, although there's things in our life right now that we know is not right, God says to each of us, I am with you. I'm with you. That's what he said to Jacob. And friends, this vision represented Jesus. I want you to notice what Jesus said in John chapter 1. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God descend, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So, so Jesus takes the Old Testament story of Jacob and he says that, you know that vision that Jacob saw in the Old Testament? He saw the heavens open, angels descending and up, up and down from heaven. Jesus is saying, I am that ladder. That's me. Jacob's vision pointed to me, right? So when jo- Jesus says, you shall see heaven open, he's referring to that story of Jacob. And he said, in the same way that Jacob saw that ladder, through my life, heaven is open. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 14, help me out tonight, this morning, friends. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to what Jesus says. No one comes to the Father except through me. My friends, this morning, this is a truth claim of the Bible. Jesus is not saying that he is one of many other ways to God. He said he is the only way. Notice the definite article. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is saying something that, quite frankly, can be very upsetting to some people this morning. Because we live in a culture that says there's many ways to God, right? Jesus is saying there's only one way to God. And that is through Christ. Jesus says, I am the way. Just as Jacob saw in the vision, the heaven open, it is through Jesus that heaven is open to you and I. This morning, and by Jesus, God cares for all our needs. That's what the Bible is saying to us this morning. Jesus is the way. My friends, every one of us here this morning can have an opportunity to put our faith in the Lord Jesus. He simply says that if we come to him by faith, that we can have this wonderful promise 
In fact, listen what happened at the end of the story. When Jacob saw the vision, he saw the angels coming up and down this ladder. Listen to what he says. He says, if God will be with me. Remember just earlier, God said he'll be with him. He says, if God will be with me and keep me and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, then the Lord shall be my God. And of all that you give me, listen to what Jacob says. What does he say at the end? I will surely give you a tenth. In other words, he says, everything that I have, dear Lord, I will give you a tenth of what I have. And so, my friends, what is this tenth? Well, the Bible calls it a tithe. In other words, Jacob was saying, "If whatever I have, dear Lord, I will give you a tithe of what I get, of what I earn, right? This was Jacob's way of acknowledging God's goodness in his life. So, when we talk about this idea of tithing, I want you to notice that Abraham, we find in the Bible, um, he also gave tithes as a response to his love for God. Listen, it tells us in Genesis chapter 14, it says, And he, Abraham, gave him, speaking about Melchizedek, there's a priest there he encounters in the Old Testament, he gave him a tithe of all. So this is not something new that we're talking about this morning. This goes right back to the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How did the faithful forefathers acknowledge God in their lives? They gave God a tenth of what they earned. So, Number one, I want you to notice a few things about the tithe. The tithe is God's. You know, sometimes I, I go to different churches and we say, well, we're giving our tithes to God now. Friends, we don't give tithe. We, does someone know? Re exactly. We return tithe. We're simply giving back to God what already is His. Listen to what it says in the book of Leviticus, the Old Testament. It says here this morning, it says, in all the tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is whose everyone it's the lord it is holy to the lord so the first thing this morning when we're talking about this biblical teaching of tithing the first thing it tells us is it belongs to god it's his okay the second uh principle about the tithe and what it does it tithe supports gospel workers or in other words people who Give their lives to sharing the good news of Jesus. I want you to notice what it says. Okay, yep, sorry about that. It says, Behold, I've given the children of Levi all the what? Tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work, should have highlighted that, of the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meaning. So let me just explain that real quickly. When God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, there were 12 tribes. How many? 12 tribes. One of those tribes of the tribe of Levi, descendants of Aaron, the high priest. So their role as they journeyed through the wilderness, their specific role was taking care of the sanctuary, the temple, all the sacrifices. That was their full-time job. And so God said to the Israelites that they were to give a tithe. It was to support the Levites because they weren't working. They weren't out there in their crops and their farms. They needed to eat. They needed to sustain themselves. So the Bible says that the tithe was to be given to the Levites so that they could do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. So kind of like in today's context, it will be people like ministers, pastors, teachers, those who, who give their lives to doing God's work. The Bible says that the tithe should be given to support them. Okay? In fact, if you listen to what it says in the uh, New Testament, Paul says these words. He says, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus, should live from the gospel. It's a very biblical term, right? And so, I want uh, some people say, well, you know, these they don't do anything, but, you know, I get this quite a bit in my, my vocation. They well, we're just supporting your work. Well, in, in essence, you are. But you know that when you look at the Bible, the Bible actually tells us that even the Levites themselves, once they received tithe from the rest of the Israelites, they were to give a tithe of that, right? So there's a, there's a flow on here. They're not just hoarding all the money to themselves. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, and the priest... The descendants of Aaron, these were the high priests. Aaron was the Moses brother. He was the high priest and his sons shall be with the Levites. When the Levites receive what? 
tithes. So who are they receiving their tithes from? They're receiving their tithes from the rest of the Israelites, right? So notice what happened next. It says, so they received the tithes. It says next, and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. So the Levites received tithe from the rest of the children of Israel. And that tithe, they would give a tithe of that and they would give it to the Lord. And so when we're talking about tithing, it is for sacred use. You know, I meet some people who don't want to support the work of God with tithing and so whatnot. And they want to spend it on things like bazaars and um, bingo and bingoing for Jesus and stuff. If you want to help the cause of God, give a faithful tithe. Give it to the Lord. And when you're saying that, you're, you're, you're asking the Lord to bless the work that's going on all across the world. And so in the churches here in Auckland, um, the tithing is a very important thing. And if you're sitting here this morning and you haven't been faithful with that, Lord, this is the time to say, Lord, forgive me. I haven't been given a faithful tithe. But by your grace today, I want to set aside that, that money and I want to use it so that God's word may be preached, may be proclaimed in all the world. Okay? So I think we've explained that. In fact, Jesus believed in returning God's tithe. I meet some Christians say, well, tithing is of the Old Testament. It's, it's not part of what new believers do today. Well, listen to this um, verse we find here in the New Testament. He's having a conversation with the religious leaders of his day, the, the, the Pharisees. Now, listen to what he says. It's a bit, of a bit of a scathing rebuke in some ways. He says, for you pay what? Tithe of mint and anise, anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Help me out, friends. Justice and mercy and faith. Listen to what Jesus says. These things ought you have these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. In other words, Jesus is saying, Hey guys, you guys are good at tithing. You're strict in your tithing. In fact, they would tithe even if they had, you know, some some what did it say there? If I could just go back to it. They pay their, their mint and they were very particular. Can you imagine a mint leaf and they're picking every tenth leaf? Yep, that's the Lord's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, that's the Lord's. Jesus is saying, you guys have got it down to a T. Keep doing it. But he says, but you guys are neglecting the weightier matters of the law. Justice, faith, mercy. And then Jesus said at the end, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. In other words, keep tithing. But don't forget what the real heart of serving God is. It's about mercy and faith in serving God. So there's a blessing in uh, tithing. So I want to talk a little bit more about the understanding of tithe. There is financial security that can be found. Now, friends, if you don't remember anything I said about this morning's talk, all right, this is the verse that you need to have planted in your mind, right? This is my favorite verse of today. It says here, Jesus, uh, the Lord speaking, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and what does God say next try me now in this says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing such what blessing there will not be room enough to receive it God's saying and this is what I love about God God is saying to you and I this morning test me now in other words put me to the test See if I will not bless you. God is actually throwing out a challenge to you and I today. He says, you know what? You, you're earning such and such money. I dare you. I challenge you. You start giving me 10%. You be faithful in that. And the Bible says that he will pour you such a blessing that you won't even have room to receive it. I don't know about you, but that's the blessing I want in my life, right? I want so much blessing that I can't, oh, too much blessing, I can't hold it back. You know, you, want, you can't even hold it. Listen to what he says next. Jesus, the Bible says, give. What does he say? Yeah. Give and it'll be yeah. given to you. This is Jesus speaking. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. My friends, this morning, it's simple. God says, put me first. That's the big heart of the matter this morning. Put me first. How, William? Put him first in your finances. God knows how much you earn. God knows how much you get every week. He's looking for people who will put him first. And he says, test me, Clive. Test me. And you see, if I want to open up the windows of heaven, 
Jesus says, the same measure you give, it will be given back to you. Well, does it really work? Well, you know, there's some people, some high-level businessmen who have owners are behind such companies as Kraft, Colgate and Heinz and the rest of it. These people, I understand, were faithful tithe payers. We don't realize that when we pick up our toothpaste and we squirt it onto our toothbrush, that the people behind, the originators of Colgate and Heinz and Kraft, they were Christians and they were faithful tithe payers. They gave the Lord 10% of what they earned. And you know what? No wonder God blessed them because they understood. Hey, I've got all this money. It wasn't time to say, well, I'm arrived now. Don't worry about God and the tithe thing. No, God says, when they put him first, God blessed them. So, whoops, let me go back. So, number two, when we give tithe, it actually increases our faith. Because the Bible tells us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we live by how, everybody? We live by faith and not by sight. My friends, it's hard. When you know you're struggling and you know that bills need to be paid and you get your pay that particular morning and you go to the ATM and you check it and you've got all that big money, the first thing is, wow, I can't wait to get it all out. can't wait to spend it. I can't wait for those new shoes. You already got 10 pairs of shoes, but you just want another one. God says, stop, put me first. And I don't know about you. I struggled with this at the start. When in my baby steps following Jesus, I would work hard. I used to be a demolition laborer. I couldn't wait for that wage to come in. When I saw all those big figures, I woohoo! Just get all the money, tick in the eighth, your password. And God says, William, where's my tithe? And you know how we do sometimes when we, we hear the voice of God speaking? And we're like, no, 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 I don't hear that, no. Just driving along and the Lord's like, William? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Don't look all holy to me this morning. God whispers to us what we should be doing. Keep the Sabbath. What are you doing? You should be keeping the Sabbath. The Lord speaks to us for our mind. And living by faith, he's saying to God, God, although I'm a bit tight this week, and there's things that need to be paid, but Lord, I'm going to choose to put you first. My friends, that's how you increase in your walk with God. When it hurts. Sometimes it's easy to give God, God tenth when you've got a lot of money. But when things are getting a bit rough at home, it's either do I tithe and go without food for a couple of days? Do I tithe even though the kids need uniform? God knows. He sees it all. Right? God says, put me first. See if I'll not open a blessing for you. I remember when I first went to college to study to be a minister and I was learning about God and um, got into a situation my first year where I, where I was struggling to pay my fees. Long story short, I got a letter in my mail that week and said, basically, I've got 10 days to get out of the dorms because I hadn't paid my fees. You know what? Just one morning, I just prayed about it. I said, Lord, I'm here by your grace, really. I'm, I'm here to study. I want to, I want to be used by you. Lord, help me. I, like Hezekiah did, the Bible says he put out his letters before the Lord. I put out that sheet right in front of the Lord, my account, 3000 and something dollars I was owing. I said, Lord, I don't have this money. And if I don't have it, I have to leave this college. No word of a lie about it. Prayed, shared a few tears. But Ten minutes later, I'm cleaning up my dorm room. I get a phone call from a fella in Melbourne. Now, I haven't heard from this guy in like three, four years. He rings me up. I won't tell his name. He says, how are you going? And he goes, I'm doing well. I'm going... He goes, how's things going? And it was kind of, long story short, he goes, just wondering, just praying about it. We're just wondering. We'd like to give you a financial donation. Do you need any money? And the, the pride in my heart said, no, no, I'm all right. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And he said, no, no, seriously. We, we, we want to give you a financial gift. And I said, no, no. We went back and forth. And, he, and I said, okay, you really want to know how much I owe? I'm owe $3,000. I heard this blank. I thought he said, Hello? <laughs> You know what he said to me next? He said, we'll pay for it. And I said, what? I mean, like half of it? What, $100? What do you mean you'll pay for it? He said, we'll pay the whole thing. Do you know what that did for my faith? You know what I did? I grabbed that phone while I was still talking to him. I ran downstairs to the admission office, and you've got to wait in line with all the other people when you need to talk to the student office about your finances there's about three four students in there you know you grab a ticket and you wait in line i went right into the lady's front office and said, you won't believe what happened this man is here wanting to pay my semester's fee please and there was a man standing sitting there going what are you doing here it's my turn <laughs> i was so happy gave that lady peter on the phone 
and uh, my semester was paid just like that. And I was so, in fact, I have to share this because I'm giving, I'm trying to help someone here this morning to encourage them to start paying tithe. Leading up to that day when I had to leave the office, leave the school, my dormitory is here, the, my classroom's here, the front office to pay your bills is here. I walked all the way around the campus to get to my classroom because I didn't want them to see me in the financial department. Because as soon as they see me coming out of the dormitory, hey, that guy hasn't paid that guy. So I was hiding from them for a whole week. I walked all the way around the campus just to get to class until finally the Lord answered my prayer. God is a good God, my friends. Now I'm telling you that that's, that's his come through. There's some times where you seem to pray and things don't change. God says, keep trusting. Keep trusting. Because at the end of the day, the Bible says all things are working together for good. Our role is to simply put him first, regardless of the consequences. Like the book of Daniel in chapter 3, when the three Hebrew worthies were about to be thrown in Nebuchadnezzar's fire because they wouldn't bow down. They said, the God we serve is able to save us. But if not, it says, we will not bow down to the image. Put God first, he says. We live by faith. And how we use our money is an expression of our faith. In fact, Malachi says, going back to this verse, it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And what does he say next? Test me now by doing this. I want to challenge you this morning. If you've never started tithing and you want to start following the Lord of Scripture, begin today. Your next paycheck, reason in your heart, say this from, I'm making a commitment today. I'm going to start giving God 10%. I'm going to start putting God first and see what he does. It says, here we, got, we hear God's word and we act on it. God says, put me to the test. You know what? When you read all through the Bible, there's not many very references where God actually says, test me. In fact, the Israelites tested him a lot because they were unfaithful. But God says, test me. In other words, try me. See if I will not bless you. I've heard other stories of pastors and, and, and faithful men and women of God who've, who've prayed and God has come through. God wants to take care of us and by the way i've said this before i say it again it's not about money the issue is not god needs your measly 10 percent. he doesn't need it the real thing is how you use your money how you use your time is an expression of who really reigns in your heart that's what it comes down to got to keep going third blessing we find in tithing it promotes generosity it starves selfishness in fact, um, Jesus, when he was talking with one of these disciples or one, this person to come to him, wanted to follow him. Uh, we call him, uh, in, in Christian terms, the rich young ruler. And the Bible says about this story, Then Jesus, look at him, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way. What does he say, say to him? Sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and he went away. How, friends? Sorrowful. Sorrowful because he had great possessions. In other words, Jesus was inviting him to be a devoted follower. He could have been one of the 12. He says, guess what? Sell everything you have and follow me. The Bible says he went away sorrowful. We don't hear about this man again in Scripture. What a tragedy. I want you to notice what it says in Acts chapter 20. It says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so when we're talking about tithing, it's really, uh, it's keeping our selfish hearts at bay. We're actually, tell, we're actually developing in our character and growing with the Lord. And one of the ways we do that is we give tithe. It, it creates a generous spirit. Number four. The blessing we can find in tithing, it's partnering with God and saving people. I want you to listen about Jesus here. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus came to this world to live an ex as an example for us. He left the glories of heaven. So that you and I could have a chance to be with him. Through his poverty. Speaking about his life. His death. His, his humbling himself at the cross. 
He did it so you and I could become rich. So partnering with God, we invest in souls. And so part of the, the idea of tithing is we use it for the glory, for the expansion of God's work. I think we're making that point clear this morning. In fact, returning God's tithe is also a moral issue. In fact, listen to what Malachi says there, the prophet there in the Old Testament. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what ways have we robbed you, Lord? And, the, and God says to them, in tithes. tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even with this whole nation. So God says that when we don't give tithe, he considers it robbery. Now, you and I would never think in our wildest imagination that we rob God, but that's what we do. But particularly those who claim to follow Jesus, when we hold tithe from God, God sees it as robbery. And that was one of the problems of the Israelites. They were not keeping a faithful tithe. And God says through Malachi, this is how you rob God, tithes and offerings. We haven't talked so much about offerings this morning, but essentially the nuts and bolts of it is tithing is 10%. Offering is what we decide from from how we feel God's blessed us, we give. There's no set amount, right? Tithing 10%, offering is whatever the Lord has put on our hearts. That's the general principle of offerings. And God says through Malachi that they were not returning a faithful tithe and giving their offerings. So there's a story here of this young man in the Bible and he was more interested in his possessions than he was in serving God. He says, I will do this. This is what Jesus is talking about his parable here. I'll pull down my barns, build greater, and there I'll store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So here's this man, and this is what some of our people in our culture is like. They build all these expensive houses and all their mini kingdoms here on earth. And this is what Jesus is saying about this man. But listen to what happened next. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And though, then, then whose will those things be which you have provided? You see, God says that he is I guess what's the word I could want to use? He is against those who use their means and all their time to building their own kingdoms, if I could put it that way. Listen, look, let's just be honest. There's nothing wrong. God wants us to live a successful and happy life. I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to have certain things. But when we allow materialistic things to be the all-pervading motive of why we live, of getting bigger houses and a yacht and a boat and a this and a that at the expense of serving God and His work, God has a problem with that. Because He knows that deep down, that's the real idol, the real God in our hearts. Listen to what Jesus said. He says these words, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole, what everybody? World, world and loses his own soul. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus is pleading with the culture of his day. He's pleading with us. My friends, this morning, what profit is you if you have all the money in the world? You've got the best house in New Zealand, in Auckland. He says, well, how good is that? If you do that at at the expense of losing your salvation. Jesus is trying to help us think of our priorities in life. What's more important? The big house, the six-figure paycheck? Living with the most expensive clothes, or is it serving God? And he says to us this morning, there's no profit. If you gain the whole world, at the end of the day, you lose your own soul. And listen, Jesus presses further into the matter. He says in the book of Matthew chapter 6, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your heart is on the things of this world, it will show in how you spend your money, how you use your time. Things of this world are more attractive. But if your heart is, is focused on God and His coming kingdom, it will be expressed in how you live your life, how you spend your time, what you fill your mind with. Jesus says, your treasure is where your heart will be. And that's what really this morning's talk is about. Where is your heart this morning? If it is founded on God, then these things, by the grace of God, will be part of your life. I've got to keep going. So we're invited this morning to bank our treasure in heaven. And so just very briefly, talking about the tithe, how do we calculate it? Basically, a tithe just simply means a tenth. And so if you and I were working this week and we earned $100, a tenth is simply 10%. So if we earned $100 this past week, how much is a tithe? Tithe is simply a tenth. Isn't God good? 
What if it was the other way around? That God wanted 90% and then we have 10. God's good. He says, you have the 90%. But the 10th is mine. And so a 10th is, the way, is, is, a tenth is $10 of 100. And the offerings, as I said earlier, it's up to us. God doesn't give a specific amount. It's up to us how much we give or how little. And it's how good God has blessed us during the week. And so, as we kind of su- summarize this morning's presentation, the keys to financial security is, number one, we trust God. We rest in His care. We make God first priority in our life. And you're doing that this morning, whether you realize it or not. You've decided to, to spend time in listening to the Word of God. And so, you're applying that right now. Number three, we remember that God owns everything. Doesn't need our tithe. Doesn't need the money. But it, it's acknowledging that the things we have belong to Him. Number four, we remember we are managers or stewards of God's many blessings. And how do we do that, friends? Like Jacob said, we return a tenth of what we have. I hope your minds are thinking right now of, of your situation. And, and maybe the Lord is convicting you this point. Man, I haven't given on a tithe. Some of us here who are professed Christians, we know better, but we haven't done it. The good news is, I love Lamentations chapter 3. His mercies are new every morning. And God invites us to start giving a faithful tithe. I love what it says here. Uh, Dottie Rambo says, The things that we love and hold dear to our hearts are just borrowed. They're not ours at all. Jesus only lets us use them to brighten our lives. So remind us, remind us, dear Lord. And so we're talking about tithe and we're talking about all the good things. It's a reminder that the good things we have belong to God. In fact, going back to that verse that we shared earlier, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. Friends, the, the, the real heart of the matter is that God has given everything for us. God gave all of heaven in one gift in Jesus. And how should we as finite human beings, sinful as though we may, we may be, how can we express our gratitude to the great God of heaven of how he's blessed us? How can we express our gratitude to God for all the blessings that he gives us? And by the way, the trials in our lives are blessings too. Because if we didn't have these trials, it wouldn't help us to see how much we need God. So all things, Paul says, work together for good. As we go back to the book of Revelation, I just want us to remind us why this is so important. The economic global collapse will be just around the corner. We are told there that America will play this role. Listen, it says, He, the land beast we saw the other night was America, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand. Come the night, I'll explain to you what that mark is on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell. There it is again. This economic global, uh, I guess, enforcement of uh, paying this money to this so-called beast that we find Revelation, except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. My friends, for most, money will be more important than God. Do you believe that? For some, it will be. Like that rich young ruler, they hear God's voice speaking to them, but they say, no, I can't, I can't let go of that. I've worked too hard for this. And so unfortunately for some, they hear a message like this, but they're not willing to let go. They're not willing. And I hope that's none of us here this morning, friends. I hope that you've heard the voice of God to you today. And you're saying in your heart this morning, I want to be a faithful follower of God. How do you do that? You give God your best. Yes, we talked at length about the financial side. But it talks about your entire being. Your mind, your heart, how you spend your time, your aspirations, your motives. A Christian doesn't just live for this earth. He lives for the honor and glory of God's name. In the Lord's Prayer, he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As Christians, we are to live now as if though we're in the very, very atmosphere of heaven. And if you're a Christian here this morning, people should look at your life and say, Something's different about that man. Something's different about that woman. That's the way God has ordained it. That through us, 
the picture of Jesus. And what a frightening thought to think that God will allow his reputation to be hinged upon my life as I live my day, day to day. I want you to know this morning, friends, you can trust the Lord. Do you agree with what I'm saying this morning? You can trust the Lord. Proverbs 3 tells us, trust in the Lord, does anyone know? With all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, the Bible says, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. That was one of the first verses I memorized as a young baby Christian because it was so simple. God says, trust me and I'll take care of you. Trust in the Lord. My friends this morning, trust God this morning. Yes, I've talked at length about tithing, but I'm just saying, in your life, trust God. Young people, you're sitting here this morning, when you're thinking about what to do in your career, trust God. Ask Him, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? If you're sitting here and you're a parent, ask the Lord, how can I be the best parent for my child this morning? How can I show them how much that that you mean to me? We all have that question to ask. How can we trust God? If you're sitting here this morning and work seems to be more important to you than God, than keeping His Sabbath, I want to say to you this morning, trust God. Walk into that place and say, Monday morning, I'm sorry, I can't work that day anymore. It's going to be hard. You're going to be scared. You don't know what's going to happen. They might sack you. But do it. I remember when I first started learning these things, I applied for a job at Primo Meats Factory in Chalora in Bankstown. I'll never forget. I... Went through the the agency and I sat down in an interview with the man and he said, okay, this is your thing. After all the small talk, he gave me my roster. And he said, okay, now you need to work on this Sabbath every second, third week rotating. I just said, I I kind of (laughs) shivered in my heart. I said, I can't do that. (laughs) And it wasn't coming out. And so I said, yep, 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 yep. And I was kind of like, yep, yep, yep. Listening to him, but I, right at the end, I said, sorry, man, sorry. I was just about to walk out. I said, look, something I would tell you, I can't work on that day. No, oh, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, we'll ring you back. We'll ring you back. Never, he never, never heard from him again. <laughs> Here's the moral of the story. You put God first. He will bless you. If you forget everything I said this morning, God's inviting you and I to simply put our faith and trust in Him. If He, if he blesses you financially, praise the Lord. If you find yourself being faithful and you're just scrummaging to find next, the next meal, praise the Lord. In all things, give thanks, the Bible says. I close with this story. The story is told of a, of a family. They, um, for, unfortunately, they were living in the house and the house caught on fire. And so the story says that while they were in the fire, that the, uh, the family just rushed up. They woke up in the, the fire. You know, the, the, the house was on fire, so they made their way out. And finally, the father came out, and the young, young little girl was still stuck there in that fire. And she was up there in the, on the, upstairs in the room, and she was, and she was basically crying because all of the, the fire was all around her. And the father was downstairs outside saying, Honey, I'm right here. Jump out. She couldn't see through the dark. She says, Daddy, are you down there? She says, Daddy, are you down there? And the father says, yes, I'm here. Just jump out the window. I'll catch you. And she thought about it for a minute. She couldn't see through the dust, through the smoke. And now the smoke was getting worse and worse. And if she stayed there any longer, she would have died from the, from the, from the, from the fumes. And so finally, the dad said, jump out. I'm here. And the little girl took faith. And she didn't know where she was jumping from. She jumped out of the window by faith and the father caught her. It's a bit like that with our presentation this morning. God's saying to you and I this morning that if we would jump out and leap out and trust God by faith, God says he'll take care of us. Seek first the kingdom of God. And I appeal, I close this morning with an appeal. My appeal is simply this. If you want to say to the Lord this morning, Lord, I hear about this biblical concept of tithing. I understand that you want to take care of me. And I want to, by your grace, as you say in Malachi, I want to test you. I want to put you to the test. Uh, Don't just do it for two weeks. Oh, well, you haven't blessed me. It's finished. You just keep being faithful to the Lord. You want to say that this morning? Say, Lord, I want to be faithful to you. Would you just raise your hand where you are right now? You just raise your hand to the Lord and say, Lord, you know my situation. You know my needs. You know what's happening at home. You know that I'm struggling to make ends meet. But if you put up your hands to the Lord this morning and say, Lord, I'm trusting you. God says he'll take care of you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, 
as we close our morning's presentation. Lord, the burden on my heart is that everyone here this morning would see that you're a loving God. Not only do you love us, you demonstrated that when you gave your one and only son. Lord, this morning there are people here this morning who maybe this has been the first time they've heard about this biblical concept of tithing. Lord, would you just replace on their heart a desire that as they give, that you have promised to bless them. Father, there are some people this morning, they've heard this talk before, but for some reason or another, you have been second place in their life and they want to recommit and say, Lord, by your grace, I want to be a faithful, devoted follower of you and I want to do everything I can with my means to give a faithful tithe and an offering. Father, there are some this morning, they're still struggling about this idea. They're still wrestling with the concept of whether you are real. Some of them still are are still wrestling with this idea whether they can trust you. Lord, would you please bless them too. And so, Lord, as we close our talk, I just want to close with what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. Lord, may each person come to that place where they seek you, put you first, and, Lord, may they watch the blessings flow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this morning's presentation. I hope that you feel free this evening.